Thank you once again for um, joining me on this journey through this new series called Liturgy, Gathering Around the Practice of Non-Duality. I apologize ahead of time. Um, at the time of me recording this, if you remember from the video last week, if you tuned in last week, uh, my spouse ended up testing positive for COVID uh, the week that I am recording this, which is a week before <laughs> this going live. But yeah, I'm piece it all together here. So I, I'm doing my best to record these videos in places where, one, there's not a person with COVID in a room, and two, I have two children, and they're kind of spaced out, and this is about the only quiet, the quietest place right now that I can find to record this. Uh, my, my spouse, thankfully, she's doing a lot better um, as of the time of this recording and is able, she's a dance teacher, and she's able to do some uh, Zoom dance sessions um, this afternoon. So if you hear a voice echoing in the, uh, you know, through the video, it's her giving some instruction to her, her dancers. So as I said, thank you again for joining me through this series. Uh, it's something I'm quite excited about. I'm geeking out pretty hard about. I've been writing all kinds of stuff for it. So thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you find something meaningful out of it. Uh, if this is the first episode that you're tuning in for, for the series, you may want to push pause and go back and listen to the introductory episode first. There's some definitions and things that I give there that might be helpful uh, for you. Uh, and some, some reasoning. I'll, I'll unpack some of this too. But As I mentioned before, in this series, I'm going to unpack the mystical elements of the various parts of the Christian liturgy as I see and as I experience them as a priest. It's purely my perspective, right? And my goal here is to unpack it all as best as I can for everybody listening, but especially for those who may not be all that familiar with the historic Christian liturgy as it is practiced in the Episcopal Church. In other words, my goal is to help outsiders understand the core of what it is that we Episcopalians and so many other Christians across the globe do on Sunday mornings. And as I said in the last episode, one of my goals, this is really the, the big thing, is to persuade people of the importance of gathering together with others in a faith tradition regularly, not just Christmas and Easter, my friends. Yeah, more than that is necessary. And the goal is to sell people on the importance of practicing spirituality together with other people within a communal context. And I'm attempting to show, furthermore, how the historic Christian liturgy, what we, what we do on Sunday mornings, could really benefit and even complement whatever spirituality people outside of the stained glass walls are practicing or, or, or are seeking to practice these days. <clears throat> now granted, I am fully aware that we are still in the thick of a global pandemic and that there are certain risks when it comes to gathering together publicly. I know this. Uh, there's still people in my parish who haven't been able to return yet, even though we've been open for six months now, because they are in the high-risk category themselves, or because somebody close to them that they're having to care for uh, is in that high-risk category, and they don't want to inadvertently spread the virus. They don't want to take that risk, right? Uh, my aim in this series is not to try to goad or to prod these folks back into the pews. I am not a pandemic denier. My spouse just tested positive for COVID, and it's not been a fun time, my friends. Uh, so I'm not a pandemic denier. People still need to use their discretion and stay as safe as they possibly can. They need to do what love requires. It's been a theme in our church and in our diocese since the beginning of the pandemic. You've got to do what love requires you to do. And if love requires you to stay home and to, and to play it safe, by all means, do that, right? Uh, to not take that risk. So no, that's not what this series is about. I'm not trying to like guilt trip people back into the pews who would love to be there, right? Um, but have, have to put safety first, right? No, this is a big picture sort of project. I am thinking long haul, not immediate future here. I am trying to address some Western cultural issues as a whole, attitudes and habits that have long existed regardless of this pandemic, not the immediate issues surrounding the pandemic itself, right? Bigger picture stuff here. Bigger Western culture picture stuff here. And again, my angle here is purely mystical or spiritual. 
people who've spent a lot of time in a liturgical tradition like ours, like the Episcopal Church, they may feel like I'm not being comprehensive enough with what I'm talking about in this series, or they may feel like I'm focusing too much on things that they would deem as being of very little importance. Uh, many people who have a passion for liturgical studies, I have found, for example, they tend to really zero in on the history of the liturgy and how it has developed or how it, is, how it has devolved in their minds over the passage of time. Yeah, that's not really my concern here at all. It's not that I don't have opinions about such things or that I haven't studied these types of things extensively because I really have for a very long time. It's just that's not what this project is about. Personally, I've had a passion for studying liturgy for years now, for a decade or more. Uh, it started long before I became an Episcopalian even. <laughs> but truth time, I have found that people who often talk about and teach about the liturgy, those folks who tend to focus on it the most, they tend to be the most painfully irrelevant <laughs> whenever it comes to actually applying the liturgy to the lives of everyday, ordinary people, helping them to make any sense of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Worst of all, these folks who emphasize liturgy a lot, they tend to strip the mysticism right out of the heart of it. So much so that people cannot find points of contact between their own prayer lives and the liturgy itself, which is a huge problem. So my goal is to not do that. <laughs> my goal, I'm hoping that it will I'll provide something that's really relevant, uh, not boring, and at least somewhat exciting <laughs> for you who are listening, right? Uh, it excites me at least, so, yeah. Yeah, in other words, I'm trying to present the liturgy to you all in a way that I wish that it could have been presented to me on several different occasions. So what I'm gonna, going to do, I'm going to take the Eucharistic liturgy as it is now, as it is practiced in my little parish, and I'm going to go from there. I'm going to go from that lived experience uh, within a real-life parish. And again, my sincere hope is that many spiritual but not religious people will be able to perceive that whatever it is that they are looking for in their lives, that like mystical experience that they know to be true but they don't quite know how to name it just yet, my hope is that they can discover that what they're looking for can be found and is found in the rituals and rhythms of the church's rich liturgical tradition. Um, yeah, before I go on any further, I'm reminded of a story of a good friend of mine who, even though he grew up in the church, he ended up leaving uh, the church for a long season because he fell in love with Eastern spirituality. And he was falling more and more out of love with the church, as many young people are prone to do these days, and for the last several decades even. Um, and so he, he actually uprooted and moved to India. And after spending some time in India, basically living as a Hindu monk and practicing under a guru, his guru one day asked him why he had traveled all this way to the other side of the globe to find the thing that had been in his tradition that he grew up with. And his guru told him that what he was looking for in Hinduism and Eastern spirituality in general, that it can be found in the teachings of the saints and in the mystical center of the Christian faith. Uh, just because it's been neglected heavily does not mean that it's not there. And so his guru sent my friend back <laughs> to the States, and now he's an Episcopal priest. And it's a common story. There's a lot of people, especially during the 60s, who made a, the journey eastward, and the East sent them back um, with renewed insight when it came to their own tradition that they left behind. Yeah, it's, it's here. It's here in our tradition too, my friends, that spirituality that people are looking for. It is here. Now, one more thing before we dive into this week's theme. Uh, in talking in this particular way about the liturgy, the way that I'm talking about it and presenting it, uh, this liturgy that's like the main thing that we church people do on Sundays together, my goal is to raise the bar quite a bit, actually, to remind Christians of why we should be coming together to begin with and why we need to now, more than ever, ensure that we are keeping the main thing the main thing. 
we need to ensure that we actually get it, or at the very least, that we're trying to get it, right? For far too long, many of us in the church, we have not known what it is that we really have, this great treasure that's just waiting to be opened, unwrapped. I think that most Christians in liturgical traditions, they tend to treat the liturgy a lot like a valuable collector's item. Did any of you have parents growing up who uh, would never let you take a rare and valuable toy out of the wrapping, out of the box? Uh, they wanted to preserve it, right? Well, the point, in my opinion, the point of a toy's existence is to be played with, not to be contained within a box. The point is to help create an adventurous and an imaginative, imaginative experience for a child, right? I mean, it really defeats the purpose of a toy's existence if you're never allowed to take it out of the box and play with it, my friends. If you have ears to hear. <laughs> well, the time has come for us in the church to take the liturgy out of the freaking box. It's not meant to be preserved as much as it is meant to be played with. It can get dirty. It can get roughed up a little bit. It's fine. It will survive. We don't need to keep it in mint condition. It does not need us to keep it in mint condition. As much as we need to experience it with an adventurous spirit, the childlike spirit even. And more importantly, we need to quit slapping people on the wrist whenever they want to come in and play too. Right? Yeah. The time has come for us to unpack this wonderful treasure that we have. Now, before we examine the various parts of the liturgy in the upcoming weeks, things like processions or the scripture readings or the passing of the peace or the bread and the wine, that's how I'm going to break it down throughout this series, focus on one theme at a time. I want to take a step back first and look at the whole thing through a panoramic lens. I want us to examine the thing as a whole before we attempt to break it down into its individual parts. For I think many Christians, if not most in the Western world, have completely lost sight of the whole, of the why behind our gathering. For us Episcopalians, along with many other Christian traditions, the principal service, the main thing that we do together is the Eucharistic liturgy. And as I mentioned in the last episode, that's why watching that one first would be helpful probably because a lot of people don't know what the word liturgy means, right? I define that stuff. But as I mentioned in the last episode, the word liturgy is usually defined as the work of the people. So whenever we gather together, we are doing something together, creating something together. And what we are doing is something that could not be done if we did not do it together in real time, right? In order for the work to be done, a plurality has to be present. The liturgy, it needs community for it to exist to begin with. Now, the other significant aspect of this definition for the word liturgy is that it's also work. It is the work of the people. We don't come to church to passively consume a product like we do with so much other, other parts of society. We don't come to church to be entertained, right? It's not about being entertained. We come to church to do something. I suspect that most people who leave the church behind, not all, but I think most, just given the track record I've seen with folks, conversations I've had over the years, uh, some people leave the church because they're heavily traumatized by something or someone within the church. But more times than not, I think people, most of the people who leave the church behind, they do so because it isn't entertaining enough for them. Because they get bored during the services on Sundays. Well, newsflash, <laughs> if I'm describing you, uh, the church is not meant to entertain you. It's not about entertaining you. It's not about keeping you from getting bored. It's not about that at all. And for those folks who complain of boredom, uh, who still say that they're spiritual, right, um, but they're bored in church. I just have to roll my eyes every time. If you cannot sit in relative silence with other people for one hour a week and meditate on the divine, I'm sorry. That says way more about you than it does about the church that you left behind. It really does. 
So don't try to come to me and tell me about how deeply meditative and contemplative you are if you cannot manage to make it through a Sunday service once a week without getting bored. It's BS. It really is. If you're bored enough to want to leave, it only proves that you're not willing to do the work. And if you're not willing to do the work communally, it's just you're not willing to do the work individually, right? So don't try to sell me on how deeply spiritual you are, even though you're not religious. It's BS. Moving on. Rant finished. <laughs> Whenever we use the words Eucharistic liturgy, what is the work that is being done? What is it that we are creating? Well, the word Eucharist, it comes from the Greek, from the Bible, uh, and it means thanksgiving or gratitude. So the work is the practice of gratefulness. The entire liturgy from the start to the finish is a practice and gratefulness. So what is the experience of church really supposed to be all about? It's supposed to be first and foremost about being thankful together. First and foremost, it should be about creating a culture and ethos of gratitude. That's what it's about. And in the moments leading up to the part of the service where people come forward to receive the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Jesus, the whole congregation enters into the part of the service that's called the Great Thanksgiving. Uh, it's usually printed off in Episcopal bulletins, or it's, it's in the Book of Common Prayer. It's called the Great Thanksgiving. This is an important point that often goes entirely unnoticed, even by lifelong Episcopalians who've been in it for decades, right? Uh, this part of the service, it's not called the Great Petition, or the Great Intercessory Prayer Time, or the Great Time of Shame and Self-Loathing, or the Great Time of Feeling Really Shitty about our sins. That's not what it's called. It's also not called the great time of praise and worship. It's not called the great happy and clappy fun time for Jesus. It's not called that either. And it's not called the great indoctrination or the great dogma or the great repentance. No. The heartbeat, the pinnacle of the whole shebang is an expression of gratitude. It's not just thanksgiving, but great thanksgiving. It's about giving thanks for those things that we have already, the things that already have happened. It's not about begging God for something that we have yet to acquire or obtain. I mean, the Eucharistic liturgy's very existence assumes that grace has already been fully poured out, that love has already been given freely and bestowed upon all. We don't need to acquire this love or grace. That's what the Eucharist teaches us. We don't come to church in order to earn God's acceptance or favor. The whole of the liturgy already assumes that all of these things belong to us already. All that is left is to accept God's acceptance of us, to make peace with God's peace with us, to rest in God's resting in us. And all that is left to do is just express our gratitude for all that has already been freely given to us, and lovingly given to us. Hmm. It's really unfortunate, but I think a lot of what I'm probably, what I'm saying is probably a huge paradigm shift when it comes to how a lot of people think about church and what it means to experience the church. Most people come to church, I think, to get something out of it, when really church is mostly about giving something gratitude. We come to church to say thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the love that surrounds us. Thank you that I still have breath in my lungs, right? Thank you that we've been deemed worthy enough to play a role in this whole cosmic drama that is our very existence. Thank you for beauty. Thank you for the little things that make life worth living. Thank you for everything. As Meister Eckhart once wrote, if the only prayer we ever say in our entire lifetime is thank you, that would be enough. My friends, that's what we come together each Sunday to do, to say the prayer that is enough. And the interesting thing is that whenever we practice this gratefulness, when we do this work, we end up receiving something through it as well. It just happens. 
we end up receiving one of the greatest gifts of all, the reality of this present moment. Gratitude roots us in the present more so than any other practice or mental orientation, in my opinion. Because whenever we are truly grateful, we are more preoccupied with what we have than what we don't have. When we're truly grateful, we're thinking about the goodness that surrounds us in this present moment more than we're worrying about an unpredictable future that has not yet happened. Gratefulness is one of the greatest doorways into non-duality because it instantly overcomes the barrier that we normally erect between ourselves in this present moment. It gets us out of our heads, out of our anxious, frenzied thoughts, and into our hearts. And just like this prayer of thankfulness that is enough, we discover that what we are doing, it's enough. We discover that we are enough we discover that we are enough for God. What a radical revolution would take place if people just believed that they are enough. <laughs> that they are enough, period. Their existence, it's enough. Huge revolution would take place, right? Um, man. And whenever we are grateful, we also touch upon our interconnectedness with other people and with our world. I lost my place. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Continuing on. Uh, the duality that we normally erect between ourselves and our world and other people, it's overcome. Whenever we are genuinely thankful for somebody, for example, we can feel just how united we truly are to them. We realize that we wouldn't be who we are and that we wouldn't have stumbled into this happiness that we now feel without them. We realize that without them and their influence in our lives, we would not be who we are today. There's a well-known Zen Buddhist saying that I really, really like, and I have not had a lot of opportunities to share it, but I'm giddily excited that I can share it now with you. Uh, it goes like this. Before one studies Zen, mountains are mountains and waters are waters. After a first glimpse into the truth of Zen, mountains are no longer mountains and waters are no longer waters. After enlightenment, mountains are once again mountains and waters are once again waters. How? Why? Chew on it for a moment. We stumble, and I'll unpack this, we stumble upon the same truth in the liturgy if we practice it in the right way and from the right frame of mind. Before experiencing the liturgy, mountains are just mountains and waters are just waters. It's just, we see them in, in their singular existence. We see them as singular entities before us. Things, right? You could point to one thing and say, that's it. But after glimpsing into the non-duality of the liturg liturgy, after pushing aside the veil, mountains are no longer mountains and waters are no longer waters. Why? Well, after being enlightened by the liturgy, by the practice, this rhythm of prayer, of thanksgiving, right? Uh, mountains, well, I lost my spot here. <laughs> Let me back up, sorry. Uh, yeah, where was I? So after being enlightened by the liturgy, mountains are mountains once again, and waters are waters once again. So before we have the eyes to see, as Jesus says, we just see things, as I mentioned before, in their singular nature. A mountain is just a mountain to us, and a river is just a river to us. Big deal, right? <laughs> uh, there's an observer and the object that's being observed. But after being trained by the practice of the liturgy, the rhythms of the liturgy, the, the mysticism of the liturgy, mountains are no longer just mountains for us, and rivers are no longer just rivers. When we look at them again, after being trained by the liturgy, when we look at rivers, for example, we see the clouds also that produce the rain. And we see the snow 
that melted, that created these rivers to begin with. We see the atoms and the molecules, all these things that are interconnected, this like web of life, web of existence, undergirding all things. And in the mountains, we see the web of atoms and molecules. We see a vast relationship of particles that compose the mountain itself. We see surface level things like the wind and the rain and the snow that shapes the exterior of the mountain, right? Carves it out to make it the unique thing that it is. Uh, without the wind and the rain and the snow, it would not be what it is to us, right? Furthermore, we also see like the tectonic plates that push this mountain skyward to begin with. We no longer just see waters and mountains, but we see a cross section of a million little things that make these things what they are. And we also realize that if this is true of mountains and rivers and waters, right, that this is also true of us as well. While we tend to think of ourselves as individual ent entities, as separate selves, our existence is no different from that of mountains and waters. Atoms and molecules, people and circumstances and contexts and life events, plants and animals, the food we eat, the air we breathe, all of it makes us what we are. The self is literally a cross-section of an infinite amount of relationships. And we literally would not be who we are and what we are without this cross-section, without these relationships. I'm reminded here, um, and reflecting on the Zen Buddhist saying of uh, a really popular wisdom saying, well, it's not even popular, a really great wisdom saying that should be more popular that's found in St. Gregory of Nice's work, um, on the making of the human being. It's often translated as on the making of the, on, on the making of man. That's no, it's the human being. It's not a dude, not on the making of a dude. It's on the making of humanity, of the human being. Well, in this work, St. Gregory of Nyssa, he addressed the question as to why, if we human beings are the creatures who bear God's image on this planet, and we were called by God, according to Genesis, to rule over the planet and subdue it, if we're like supposed to be the creatures that reign uh, over the planet, why aren't we more powerful? Why are we so flawed and fragile, right? And mortal. Like, why aren't we the physically strongest creature if we're supposed to reign over all things? Why don't we have things like claws or shells to defend ourselves like other creatures have? far inferior, inferior creatures have, right? Um, the way a lot of people think. Why do we have to eat food where plants don't, <laughs> right? I mean, they, they have their own nourishment process, but uh, it's, it's, it seems like it would be a huge advantage if we could nourish ourselves um, the way that plants do, right? Why do we have to depend upon plants and animals for sustenance? sustenance? Questions like these are what Gregory was wrestling with and talking out loud about in this work. Here's his answer, and it's brilliant. He said that we're lacking in all of these strengths, all of these things, because if we were to be made physically perfect, we human beings are still foolish enough to mess it up, <laughs> to overlook our interconnectedness and our dependency on the whole cosmos. We would basically just blind ourselves um, to the world outside of the, the shell of the self, right? So in other words, God made us with certain weaknesses so that we would awaken to our interconnectedness to the cosmos. We would understand just how much we need Mother Earth and all of her creatures and all of the things she has blessed us with. So we are forced to take things from the earth to make clothing and shelter and tools for ourselves, whereas many other, most other animals and Life itself doesn't have to do that, right? In other words, God made us in such a way where we would realize that we depend on things around us for our survival, that we would not blind ourselves to the relationship that we share with the cosmos. Thus, we live into the image of God, not by ruling over anything, by making Mother Earth subservient to us, 
but we live into the image of God whenever we understand that our very existence is a cross-section of the entire cosmos. We are a microcosm of the greater macrocosm, if you will. And once we are enlightened to this truth, then mountains become mountains once again, and waters become waters. We're able to see, finally, the panoramic view. We're able to see the complex relationships that make these things what they are. We see just how much everything is connected. All duality is overcome, all division is overcome, and we shift into a state of non-dual consciousness. My friends, we come together on Sunday mornings to thank God for all the ways in which he and the whole cosmos that he has created has contributed to our being. We express not just thanksgiving, but great, deep thanksgiving, as we joyfully acknowledge that without God and all of the stuff around us, we would not be who we are today. So we take a moment to pause and recognize this, uh, we do, it, we do it together. Um, there are other ways, for sure, in which the Eucharist overcomes duality, uh, especially specifically in the practice of partaking of bread and wine transfigured. We'll come to that um, in the weeks ahead, so I'm not going to address that now. But for now, let me conclude this talk by summing up the main point. The Eucharistic, Eucharistic liturgy is the practice of non-duality because it is the practice of gratefulness. And gratefulness is the practice of non-duality because it is the practice of snapping awake, of waking up to the harmony and the perfection of this present moment and all that God has gifted you with through it. Peace be with you.